Hi, good morning. Um, uh, so we're going to have a change of pace from yesterday. There's going to be, um, well, I'm not sure what it's going to be. There's going to be less chemistry, I hope, that I don't, because I, I don't know any chemistry. So whatever I'd say would be gibberish. Um, I want to start by showing you this picture. Um, we heard about DNA linking yesterday and how does DNA do this. In fact, there's some things, this kinetoplast uh, DNA, um, which is actually linked on purpose. And actually the little loops serve some purpose and the big loop for the, for the processing of the, uh, the cell. So there are macro cycles and there are little cycles and the little cycles are in the right place. So not only do you have these things that duplicate, they duplicate and they stay linked together. It's not just that you have, how do they manage to duplicate while they're linked together and then come apart? These actually go back together in a special way. So I'm not going to talk about this kind of linking, all right? But this is the kind of linking I have in mind. I'm thinking of linking of things that are physical links, um, <clears throat> where you can't pass things through each other. Yesterday, somebody said, who said it? Are you here? <clears throat> Yesterday, somebody said, oh, well, I'm not going to talk about energy. Who said that? Oh, she's, already, she's already gone. Okay. She's, all right. But of course, she was talking about energy. If you try to like pull, if you pull two strands of DNA hard enough, they will break and go through each other. So topology and energy are always, you know, deeply interconnected. It's just a question of scales. I'm going to talk about work that started some time ago with Gareth, who's up there, and Brian Chen, who's not up there, and uh, ended recently with some work uh, with Ricardo Masna uh, <coughs> from Brazil. So <coughs> here's a story. Here's your first introduction to the crystals. Who's ever seen a Luca crystal before? Come on, you all have one in front of you. <coughs> Are you serious? Oh, I've never seen one. Okay, but this is what, oops, this is what, oops, oops, oops. It was so much easier when you had transparencies and you could just drop them. All right, anyhow, here is a pneumatic liquid crystal. When you look at a pneumatic liquid crystal um, <coughs> through cross polarizers, and I'll explain everything in a moment, you see places, you see these black lines, and you see these places where the black lines come together into fourfold places and sometimes into twofold places. So let me tell you what you're looking at in case you don't know. So this is how it works there's a light. There's a polarizer. There's another polarizer that's at 90 degrees, which is called the analyzer. If you send light through cross polarizers, you get you get nothing exactly. Okay, but the liquid crystal molecules in there, the pneumatic liquid crystals, are elongated rods. From the point of view of mathematics, they're just line fields, but they're molecules that are long, ellipsoidal, and long and stretched. And they're birefringent. And as a result, if they're uh, in here, they actually help rotate the light. If you, if you like light, you would say, well, there's the ordinary wave and the extraordinary wave, and they go at different velocities, and they get to the other end, and they don't cancel. Or if you like polarizers, you can think of them as a third polarizer inserted between the cross polarizers. The upshot is, is that when you see light coming through, it means that the molecules, which are <coughs> lying in the plane of the polarizer and the analyzer, are uh, letting light through. And it means that they're not along the polarizer direction or the analyzer direction. If they were along the polarizer direction, you'd have two polarizers like this and one like this. That would still give you nothing. Right? The second polarizer would be redundant. <coughs> and so... Um, these black lines are the pre-image of the direction of the polarizer and the direction of the analyzer. So there you go, topology in a nutshell, right? You take a picture with cross polarizers and you can actually see the, the pre-image of these two directions. And um, why do you see four? Well, I told you it's a line field, so I'm drawing a line field in here. Notice that I don't have any heads on these uh, lines. If I have uh, a defect here, a place where I can't tell you which direction the things go. Everywhere else I have to have a well-defined line field, so as I go around this point, the line has to rotate by 2 pi, one way or the other way. And you get four brushes. Why four? 
I get black whenever the molecules are along P or along A. So you get four brushes because it goes through the polarizer once and the analyzer once and the polarizer again and the analyzer again. Four brushes, four times. And it doesn't matter how, as long as it goes around by two pi, you get four brushes. <coughs> by the way, fancy pants, it means that these here, where you get two, tell you that the molecule is symmetric under rotations by pi. Look at that. I took a picture with something that was invented in the 1800s, polarizers with light. This is a picture taken with a microscope, something that Galileo could have uh, built. And um, you can tell something about nanometer-sized molecules, that they're the same whether they're like this or like this. It's pretty cool right? that you don't have to do that much once you know mathematics. Okay, let me actually do this again. <clears throat> so that's the pneumatic phase. And if I were a mathematician, I would classify the defects. How would I classify them? I'd have my sample here. Here's the sample. It has a bunch of defects in it. Here is the direction of the line field. So this is an angle, phi. And what I would do is I would look at some path around this defect, and I'd make a map from this path to this space, all right? So this is a map from the circle to the circle. Listening to the wrong, okay. So um, it's a map from the circle to the circle, and so I can classify those defects by the fundamental group of this thing, which I'll call the ground state manifold. It's the place that tells me all the directions that are ground states. After all, the ground state of the liquid crystal, the ground state of the line field is all parallel lines. And now I tell you <coughs> that as I go around some defect, the direction rotates. And I can tell you how much the direction rotates because it's an angle and there's maps from, the fun from this path, which I went around, to that path. And I see a black line anytime I'm here or here or here or here, for instance. But I don't want to talk about pneumatics. The next talk we'll talk about pneumatics. I want to talk about something which is a little more subtle, which we don't understand. And I hope that I can entice you to work on it with us or work on it yourself, solve the problem. And mail us a copy. All right, here is a smectic. A smectic is a crystal. And what I mean by that is that it has one dimensional order. It's like a building, right? So there's a stack. Each layer of the building can do whatever it wants. Each layer of the building can be a liquid. No organization on each floor, but the floors are separated. It's like a department store, okay? Oh, by the way, this is a real picture of a smectic. This is what a theorist writes down. They draw always parallel layers. But real smectics, when you look at them in cross polarizers, are very complicated things. But everywhere that you see the smectic, locally it looks like this. Locally, a smectic looks like this. So how would you describe a smectic? One of the reasons energy is not that interesting here is that the ground states, or the things that you see, not the ground states, the things that you see are quite complicated. Let me just tell you what we do. We write down energies. We write down energies that say things like the layers want to be equally spaced, and they don't like to bend. But I'm not interested in those. What I'm interested in is, how do I describe the layers? And I describe the layers by writing down level sets of some phase field, phi. The density of stuff is proportional to cosine of phi. Phi equals zero is the first layer. Phi equals a is the second layer. Phi equals two a is the next layer, and so on. And because phi, cosine phi, is the uh, variable of interest, you'd say, this is exactly what I did before. After all, phi, which is telling me where the layers are, is also lives on the circle. Because phi and phi plus a are the same. So you'd say, oh, it's the same thing. 
I would classify defects in objects like this precisely the same way. I would find some point where I didn't have nice order. I would go around the point in the sample. That would be a circle measurement here. And I would have a circle measurement here. But that's not true. It turns out smectics are more subtle. And the reason that smectics are more subtle is because this order is periodic in space. It's actually in space. It's not in some internal manifold, like telling me what the direction is. So, <clears throat> unlike the pneumatics. So, <clears throat> one of the things about pneumatics, which you could realize from looking at this, is all I need to do, if I actually am classifying things by the fundamental group, pi 1 of S1, oh, by the way, I, should, I shouldn't keep it a secret from you. These are just the integers. And so, since they're just the integers, the fundamental group, I can add things together, and it's true. If I take two defects where the rotation is 2 pi and bring them closer together, far away, I'll get 8 brushes. It'll look like I've gone around 4 pi. And if I've gone around plus 2 pi and minus 2 pi, as I bring those 4 brushes together, they'll all cancel with each other. They'll all link up, and I won't have any brushes at infinity. So, in fact, <clears throat> um, this is a nice abelian group. I can add the defects together because they're classified by this object. But smectics are different. There's a real theorem by Ponaru that says, look, suppose that you have a system. Wait, hold on. Uh, measured foliation. Measured foliation means locally, you can always zoom in on whatever the thing is. And it looks like this. It looks like a smectic. Except for a few points, which are singularities. That's what the, all these words mean. Measured foliation is the important one. It means that you can locally make things look like layers. And Parnaro proved that you can have a defect that looks like that. See, here is a texture. If I ask myself, what is the normal direction to the phase? Right, the normal. It goes around by 2 pi. I could talk about this. Here, the normal goes around by pi. That works because the normal and minus the normal are the same. Here, nothing happens. Here, it goes around by minus pi, minus 2 pi, minus 3 pi. Uh, minus three pi. And Bonaro proved that you could go all the way this way. You can have any negative charge you like. But you can't have any positive charge. In fact, Plus one's as high as you can go. Now, um, you can read this. It took us a long time to understand it. Here's the problem. A group is a group. And we say this thing in the United States, what, stay, what happens in a group stays in a group. And so here's this group. Uh, I should be able to combine two objects that are classified by this winding. How come I can't join them together? The group operation would tell me I could join them. I must get something with winding number two, an, a winding two or an index uh, two, zero. Why don't I get one? And Panaro proved you can't do it. And it's this thing that locally, I always have to have my layers look like this. And we didn't understand the theorem. I mean, we could read the, all the words, and we could read even sentences. But we realized to us what was going on was much simpler in our minds, is <clears throat> I told you we have this field phi. Level sets of phi tell me where the layers are. So I'm going to talk about a two-dimensional smectic because I can't draw the three-dimensional one. This green thing is just the graph of phi. It's not a physical object. It's a mathematical object. And level sets are easy. You intersect this green surface with the surface phi equals zero. And that's this level set and the next level set, and you get all the level sets, and you realize that a smectic is nothing more than a topographical map. And it's important, this thing about it being measured means that at every place there's a slope that isn't zero. And so, here you go, right? You get to basically use the ideas of Morse theory to talk about the smectic, and it's different. When you talk about a smectic, instead of talking about uh, <coughs> um, layers as the objects or the direction as the object, the phase, 
you think, oh, it's really something that lives on a mountain range. And the mountain range, level sets of the mountain range tell you where the layers are. And it's great, the layers never cross. The layers never end. Um, you can tell that you're at the top. How can you tell that you're at the top of a mountain? Go ahead. In Europe, in Europe, you, I'm asking you. Yeah, in Europe it's easy because you can buy a Coke. Yeah, right? There's always a Coke. Yeah, 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 but it's not like that. There's a Coke, there's a chocolate, you can buy lint chocolate. Everywhere in Switzerland, the top of every mountain, you can buy lint chocolate. Right? It's true, right? But in the U.S., it's what you said. You get to the top and every way else is down. Okay? All right? And, you know, all right? And so here's the, and if it's every way, oops, oops, sorry. If every other way is down, it means that as you go around, you have these closed loops, which are the plus one index one zeros. And the thing is, you say, how come I can't bring two of them together? And you know the answer, because there are mountain passes in between, and there's this thing, the mountain pass theorem, that tells you if you bring, try to bring two mountains together, you always entrain a pass. And a pass is precisely a minus one index. And so, as you try to bring the two mountains together, you lose the pass in between them, and the charges all cancel. So it's not so simple. However, it's not as simple as you can bring the two plus ones together. They always entrain this extra minus one in there. How can you have any negative charge? You can have a situation where you have, you know, 35 mountains, and you have one pass that goes down into the 35 valleys. That's not allowed in Morse theory. That would be a degenerate critical point. But it's allowed in my picture. Okay. So it's not quite Morse theory. I should probably have some other symbol here that isn't equals. <clears throat> so the idea is you can have any negative charge, but you can't have any positive charge. It means that classifying these defects is not as simple as having a group. If we're a group, I'd be able to take two plus ones and add them together. And it has something to do with the fact that you have this spacing and that you have this measure everywhere. Now, <clears throat> smectics get to enjoy something else. Now, Nobody stopped me, you guys all nodded, when I said, oh, it would be just like this problem, the original problem of the pneumatic. And here's a situation where it is the same problem as the pneumatic. Because now I have a phase field, and the phase field rotates by 2 pi, or the phase field changes by pi, or 4 pi. And what do I mean by that? These are called dislocations. These are different than those index defects. That was something about a defect in the normal to these surfaces, or the normal to the level sets. Now I'm talking about the level sets themselves. In, in the US, I'm sure it's true everywhere. Oh, I know where it's true. It's true in Bristol. Who's from Bristol? Excellent. OK, it's definitely true in Bristol. Sometimes you have these buildings that are joined together one was built like before the war, and the other was built after the war. I'm, I'm talking about World War II. And, and the, they come together, and there's more floors in the new building. Somehow, over time, they improve the technology. You need less space between the floors. And people got shorter or whatever. They, they didn't need as much space, right? And so what happens is you have nine stories here, and you only have eight stories here. The buildings are the same height, and you have to like mush them together somehow. And you do it like this. You relabel them one, two. You always call this the mezzanine, right? One of them is the mezzanine, with three, and so forth. And the weird thing would be is that if you weren't paying attention to what you were doing, you could be wandering around the building. You could start here. You could go up one floor. <coughs> Here you are, here's the ground floor. But you start on one. See, I'm adapting for you guys. Okay, you start on one, you go up to two, you come over here, now you want to leave the building. So you go down two stories, because you were on two. You, go two stories. you think you're on the ground floor, but you're not. You're on the mezzanine, you've messed up. You can't get out, you're trapped. You have to get a coffee. And so, 
That's a dislocation. You're not where you thought you were because there's this extra layer. That is the phase field changing. What am I doing? I'm looking at gra the gradient of that phase field phi, and I'm adding up the changes. And I went like this, and I added up one, and then I went over here, and I went down two. So when I did some integral of grad phi, it wasn't zero. These are classified by maps from the circle to the circle. So how do I mix these two things together? I just told you that a smectic, so they get to enjoy this kind of defect. I told you that a smectic is a topographical map. I told you topographical maps can't have ends to their lines. So how do I manage this? This will not be allowed on a topographical map. I can ask you a question. How is it possible to even draw a surface that does this? What kind of earth or what kind of planet or what kind of map or actually what kind of mountain range would give you this? Here's a hint. Remember, the graph is up. It's away from the surface. It's in your so here's the, surf, here's the xy plane. And I'm telling you that as you walk around this circle, phi changes by 1, or 2 pi, or whatever units you like. That means you've gone up. So that's a staircase. It's a spiral. It's a helicoid. And you can say, how can I work a helicoid in? Here's a helicoid. What's wrong with this helicoid? If you get the answer wrong, I get an extra five minutes. It's a negotiation. The problem is far away, the helicoid's flat. So it's not measured. It's not a smectic. I have to have a slope. Another way of saying it is I want the ground state to be equally spaced lines. So I don't want to have something which goes to flat. I want something, a mountain range that looks like this at infinity. So I, can I combine the two things together? Of course I can, right? Here's the helicoid, and I can stretch it, and there it is. It's a stretched helicoid, and I stretched it up. You know why I stretched it up? I stretched it up so that on the circle, phi and phi equals zero and phi equals one and phi equals two are exactly the same thing. I'm making this space, the mountain range, live in a periodic space. Instead of living in R, it's living on the circle. Ha <laughs> ha, the circle, right? And so then I can fit it in, and it works. And so here, oh, I don't know what's going on. Oh, that you get the other version of it. I don't know why. Okay, here's a picture of it. Now watch me take level sets of it. You ready? Okay, so there, it cuts through. You get these two black lines. You cut through, you cut through, you cut through. Do you see it? Do you see there's two extra layers coming in? There's the dislocation. Watch, there it is. See? It's a dislocation. Two extra layers. And I can go and I can even get the other geometry if I want. The one where I get one extra layer is a little more singular because I have to have only half of a helicoid, but you can do it too. So here you have the situation where you have dislocation. So if you make a mountain range that lives on the circle instead of the real line, then you're good. Then you can actually completely describe the defects and smectics. <clears throat> and you can say, why am I telling you about this? What's this workshop on, anyhow? It's on links and knots. But I'm going to try telling you that the story of links and knots of this object is very complicated. All right? I'm not talking about vortices and superfluids or defects in pneumatic liquid crystals. I'm talking about defects in a very complicated system because it has all these extra problems. The defects don't add. Even the plain, simple story, the defects don't add nicely. There's no group. I can't use homotopy theory so easily. So we've been exploring this system. Our goal is to really understand it. Our method is to just find problems that we can solve, that we can understand. So let me go from two to three dimensions. Oh, do you have a question? 
Do you have a question? Ask me. You, you, it's okay. Sorry? Who says that? Well, of course, I have a theorem for you. Everything shown at this conference is too deep. <laughs> okay, but I'm not, but here is a picture. See, there's the extra dimension, why? Okay, this is the XYZ plane. This is a section in the ZX plane. I have complete symmetry in the Y direction. So this is an edge dislocation. Look at the light blue line, only the light blue line. You have one coming in and you have two going out to infinity. Here's the dislocation. These different colors, phi equals zero is the blue color. Phi equals 0.1 is this darker blue. Phi equals 0.2 is this even darker blue. Phi equals 0.3 is this pinkish color and so forth. I'm drawing all the values of phi, all the level sets of phi, not just phi equals zero and phi equals one, all of them. They're all there. The phase to wrap around has to be defined everywhere. And this point here is the place where I've added an extra layer. There's an extra 2 pi of phi in here. I've squeezed in an extra whole 2 pi. I can write down a phase field if you like. But I notice something. Suppose I draw the normals to the surfaces. The normals to the surfaces around this point wrap around. So this is an index 1 defect in the normals. But I have this funny boundary condition. It's that measured foliation boundary condition. Far away, the normal points up. The normal isn't zero. If I were a superfluid, I would say far away grad phi is zero. But here, grad phi isn't zero. Grad phi has to point in some direction. There has to be a slope. And so now I can use the mountain pass theorem again if I want to call it that. That's, I think, overkill. I have a situation here where the line points down near this defect. And I, have a line, and I know out here the line points up. Somewhere the line must vanish. There's another zero. Grad phi has another zero. Grad phi has a singularity here and it has a zero right here. And that means that here I have a place where the, I have a plus one index dislocation or plus one index uh, zero of the director field or the normal. But here I have a minus one index one. There are the two points, the plus one and the minus one. And they're separated and they make the dislocation. Did you see that? You have these disclinations, the things you saw in the pneumatic, and put together, they make this extra layer in the semantic. But I have to have them. They always have to be in pairs. In other words, if I want to add an extra layer, I am forced to have a disclination pair, a pair of uh, <coughs> singularities in the orientation. It's unavoidable. Yes? No. Yeah. That's right, but I'm just talking about the topology. You're saying it could be that the energy is so high you just get a giant spot in the middle that blocks all of them out. I agree. Well, then I have to worry about what I do on that boundary. And typically, as you know, it never really goes to zero. It just decay. It goes. It gets. It gets smaller. So, what happens if I look at this system? So here's this edge dislocation going through the sample. I've added an extra layer. Suppose now that I want to tilt it. So instead of it going along this way, now it's going to be more three D. Okay. Now the dislocation goes like this. This is still where the layers are. This is the layer normal. So the whole thing gets tilted a little bit. But it's still true when I look at a section perpendicular to the defect line, I will still get these layers. There'll be a different spacing, they'll be stretched out, but I'll still have this hyperbolic point and this uh, dislocation point, or if you like, the mountain and the saddle. Until eventually, I have a helicoid. Remember that helicoid? This is the boring helicoid. Right, this is a defect. Look at this. Here's phi. 
That's the, level, the phase field. I look at a level set, phi equals zero. So z is arctangent y over x. It's a nice helicoid. This is a defect in the smectic, which is allowed, a 3D smectic. And this doesn't have to have this hyperbolic point because these guys just go around. There's no condition on grad phi in the xy plane. Right here, there was a condition in grad phi in this funny uh, tilted uh, <coughs> xz plane. But here, there's no such condition. And so you lose this property. A screw dislocation, which is what we call this because it looks like a screw, it doesn't have to have a hyperbolic point, but this one does. So <clears throat> I become interested in how do you link together defects in these materials? Are they linked? Are they linked the way that DNA is linked? Or are they linked in Landau theory, where you have two superfluid vortices, and you say, well, they're linked because there's some energy cost to have them pass through each other? But that's a very small energy compared to breaking apart two pieces of DNA. And what I want to know is, are they topologically linked? What I mean that is, can you actually pull them apart, or does topology force you to leave a thread behind as you pull them apart? So here is my screw dislocation. You see, blue might be the level set phi equals zero, and red is phi equals you know, two thirds, and green is phi equals one third, and blue is again phi equals zero. And here's the screw dislocation. And out at infinity, it fits onto flat layers, and that's OK. Now, suppose I have an edge dislocation going around it. Watch carefully. So what do I mean by that? An edge dislocation is a place where two red layers become one red layer. The mezzanine and the second floor just joined to be the second floor. So <clears throat> here's the edge dislocation. It's a closed loop in the xy plane. What do I have to do? I have to pinch together the two red layers over here. But as I go around, because the screw dislocation is changing, I have to pinch together the two green layers here. And in back, I'll have to pinch together two blue layers. So what I see is that on this edge dislocation, there's actually a winding. The winding is, what color do I pinch together as I go around? You could say to me, why don't you just keep pinching the red together? Well, I can't. I would have to stretch everything in some terrible way. It would, effectively, I would have to tear the smectic to do that. <clears throat> I'll make this more precise. Here's a picture. I don't know which picture helps more. I think the picture on the left doesn't help me at all. It's like some drill that was badly made, right? So here's a screw dislocation at infinity with one less layer than the screw dislocation that's going up the center. Another way of saying it here, here are the level sets. What I'm doing here is I'm rotating around the central axis. So here's where the screw defect was, that helicoid, and I'm going around it. <coughs> here, are the two, here, are the, here is the edge dislocation. Do you see, as you go around, the color changes. In other words, what's happening is there's a winding on the edge dislocation that's being induced from the boundary conditions at infinity. The fact that at infinity I have layers is forcing me to connect those layers to the edge dislocation on the inside. You don't get that usually. Usually when you talk about superfluids or superconductors or even pneumatics, at infinity everything's constant. And you don't have to worry about this. But now you do. Right? It means that, in fact, I have a problem I can't compactify my, my sample. Usually I could say that every point on the boundary of the sample is the same. I can compactify the plane to the sphere. But I can't do it here because at infinity I don't have constants. So I either have to do it in a finite region or I have to have some kind of really strange... I have to have a defect at infinity. right? And so here's the structure. It turns out it's in here, here you have a structure where you have a dislocation going around a screw dislocation. And you see, as you go around, these lines over here, it looks like a dislocation. Over here, it looks like a dislocation. But as you go from the left to the right, the lines of constant color have a shift in them. They have a, a jump. And there's no way to get rid of that. So that if I tried to 
take these two lines and bring them back together, I would have to have a singularity in the phase. To me, this means they're really linked. There's no way to take, if you had a screw dislocation here and you started running at it, you can do this with dogs, you can do this experiment. <clears throat> I have my college roommate. My college roommate, his mother was a veterinarian. They went to the beach and they, 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 just, they had two dogs and they decided to keep the dogs from running away. They would just tie them together. Forgetting that dogs are pack animals. They don't run apart, they run together. So they went around the beach taking everybody out with this rope in between them. But that's exactly what this is. Here the things are running. Okay, There's no way to take that rope, cut it, and rejoin it. That would mean cutting all these phase lines and rejoining them. There'd be a terrible singularity in the phase lines. So these are linked. These are linked like ropes tying dogs together. <clears throat> They're not linked like superfluid vortices or vortices in a liquid, which are energetically for, you know, suppressed from crossing. These are topologically suppressed from crossing. <clears throat> Knots. I've, people have already seen this table, right? So uh, I feel bad, although I can't imagine that any journal would ever accept a title like this anymore. The first seven orders of naughtiness. Can you imagine that? I mean, maybe the New York Times. It, it turns out you don't know this. In the US, you know, people aspire. We want to publish in nature and science, you know, all those things. People really want to publish in the Times Literary Supplement, right? That, that would be the pinnacle of, of, of your publication, right? So here are the knots. I'm going to explain to you how this invariant I'm talking about is closely related to knots and actually is much simpler from the point of view of knots. So suppose instead of having a tangled set of defects, I had a knot in my smectic. Okay? Mark Dennis, he sort of introduced this idea to me. This idea that you have a knot, but the field around the knot encodes the whole knot. The knot just happens to be a simple part of the whole field, but the field has the knot in it. So, this is also uh, Mark Dennis and, uh, and uh, John Hanay's beautiful picture. They say, let's think about how Link and Twist and Writhe work. I don't know why this says Edinburgh, right? I'm bringing, uh, this is Trieste, okay? Trieste, sorry. So, they said, look, Everybody knows link equals twist plus writhe. Here is a situation where I only have writhe. And here is a situation where I only have twist. So what does it mean to have only writhe or to have only twist? So... Uh, Here I have my belt, okay, like so. And you can see the two stripes. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate it, give it a two pi twist, like so. And now you see these things. So this configuration is twist. How do I know that? Because sometimes you can't see the red and the green stripes. There are times when the red and the green stripes wrap around each other. That's because there are places where there's always, no matter what projection I give you, there's always a place where you can't see the belt. But this <coughs> is writhe. Because you always see the red and the green. Writhe is when the red and the green cross at the same time so that you always see them. Non-local crossings and twist is when they have local crossings. And you can convert one to the other. See how simple that is? Okay, this beautiful way of interpreting things. I lost my uh, advancer. It's okay, I'm, 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 wearing, I'm wearing underwear, it's all right. It's, okay. <coughs> um, boxers, okay, so anyhow, <coughs> here we have link is twist plus writhe. Let me think about, if something, Hello? Uh, maybe I've gotten too far away. I'll just touch the computer. <clears throat> so here's a knot. Here's a trefoil knot. 
here's its ciphered surface. All right, what I'm going to show you is that there's a natural framing of this knot. There's all this work, beautiful work about how, how is uh, link equals twist plus rise, um, uh, what's that word, generalized to whole fields and to whole fluids and the uh, helicity of the fluid. But here, I have a much simpler problem. I have a system where here is my knot, here is its ciphered surface. The ciphered surface defines one framing of the knot. Let me see it. The remote is dead. Hold on. Oh, there you go. So I'll remind you, this is from Mark Dennis. Here is a trefoil knot. Here is its whole vibration in cipher surfaces, which is quite pretty. See, each of those is a smectic layer. You see, a fiber knot is naturally a smectic. Okay. <clears throat> So let me make my vibration here is the unknot, and I can make a cipher surface for it, and then I can it, the cipher surface is orientable, so it has a normal everywhere. And um, <clears throat> what I do, I call this an epsilon ball around the line. Is that what you call it? An epsilon tube, right? What? A, a tubular neighborhood, tu, na, tubular neighborhood around this uh, line, and I intersect the tubular neighborhood with the cipher surface to get another curve, this one. And then, as uh, Tom Michonne would tell me, since the normal is everywhere defined, I can take that new curve and just push it off the surface, and that means that these two loops are not linked. Okay, the link is zero. But fortunately, I have another framing, right? So I can talk about, if I talk about this guy, I'll call this the surface where phi equals zero. It's one of the level sets, right? And so this is the line I get. I'll call it H zero. It's the line I get from that ciphered surface defined by the smectic. But fortunately, I have another frame. I have this point here. You see, I don't know the value of phi at this point where the dislocation is because it has all values of phi. But the place where there's a saddle where grad phi vanishes is perfectly well defined and this guy always has one with it. So I can use this curve as the other curve. So I have a framing from H and I have a framing from H0 if you like. And because the framing is a such that, I'm going to put the H's and D's, the D is the green curve, here's the, knot, the projection of the knot, the framing is always in such a way that the H curve, you can always see it, it doesn't twist around the green curve, right, because it's, it's always just, it has to do with the gradient of the phase field. And so now I can talk about this, and we know from my belt and from Mark Dennis that uh, the red and the green curve, it's pure rise. No link, no twist, all rise. So um, here we go. I'm going to take link equals twist plus rise for two different curves. Here is D and H. That was H is the induced one from the smectic. Here is D and D zero. I guess I called it H zero. That's the one that I get from the Seifert surface. This one has no link. The rise cancel. I can subtract. And I discover that the winding, which is my topological invariant, that's telling you how the color goes around as you go around the dislocation, is nothing more than the linking number of D with H. So the smectic gives you a natural framing of the curve, the defect curve, until something terrible happens. Davide, do you know? You're taking up my time. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you know the answer? If I take my knot, after all, the knot is a three-dimensional object. Why couldn't I rotate it? Why does this projection have to be in the XY plane? Why can't I rotate it so that the defect starts pointing straight up? When the defect points straight up, I lose H. Remember I told you that? If you have a helicoid... The helicoid doesn't have a natural hyperbolic point. And that's a problem, because as I do it, now the defect tilts up, 
and it's gone. I don't have my framing anymore. What do I do? And I say to you, here's the math question. This is about the boundary conditions. So I can't take my sample and compactify it. I have to take a finite sample. So I take a cylinder. All right, a cylinder, it might be an infinite cylinder this way. It doesn't have to be infinite. It can be, you never have to be infinite. It's just, it's just a cylinder. And I have boundary conditions on the top and bottom. And on the sides, I have these graduations, right? The phase going through, phi equals zero, phi equals one, and so forth. As I take my edge and try to tilt it up, that other curve, so here I had this. This is supposed to be green. I'll do this. I picked red, white, and green. I was trying to be patriotic. So here are the two things. This guy moves further and further away. As I take this guy, this line, and tilt it out of the xy plane and try to point it up the z direction, this guy moves further and further away until it goes off to infinity. That's why it's gone. It doesn't disappear because it merges with this point. It disappears because it gets pushed away. Now, I can't, there is no infinity in my system. I have a cylinder. It means that at some point this passes through the cylinder and violates whatever boundary conditions I had on the cylinder. So, if I do the topology right and keep everything inside, I can never let this guy passed through the wall of the cylinder. Another way of saying it is I can't take my knot. If I try to take my knot and rotate it arbitrarily, arbitrary rotations will violate the boundary condition on this cylinder that I have, which has graduations, right? These are, these are phi equals one, zero, minus one, two, three and so forth. So as I move up, I have my finite cylinder. If I try to rotate the knot arbitrarily, it'll mess up these boundary conditions. So this doesn't solve the problem. It just points out the same problem. Because I have this measured foliation, infinity is problematic. There are boundary conditions at infinity or on the cylinder actually come back in and create linking on the inside that I can't get rid of. And because I can't get rid of it, <clears throat> I can quantify it. And it's 2 pi times the linking number. And that's the end. Oh, I don't need that. Okay, thank you.